It's great to have you again today on our Side by Side. And yesterday we were thinking about the whole idea of our attitude, really, being willing, having having active attitude in regard to searching and seeking and really challenging that sort of passiveness where a person says, well, I, I'm not sure and I, I don't know. And I say, well, would you not like to be sure? You know, do you want to do you want to engage in this? Would you not be willing to give yourself to this? And I think that's the challenge that comes to me, certainly, through thinking about Thomas again. But let's go back and look at the text. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, I want to stop there for a minute. The text tells us that Thomas was not with them. They were all there, and they heard Jesus' voice, and they saw Jesus' person. The Bible says he showed them his hands and his side. So Jesus had taken the initiative to come in his glorified body, that body that could pass through the the walls and the doors. And he enters in and he shows them his hands and his side and he says to them, peace be with you. They have this experience. And maybe that's a fact that's overlooked when we think about doubting Thomas. We're maybe a little bit too hard on him, aren't we, whenever we speak of that. And what happens then about this idea of when you take a small step of faith, when you act upon what you already have, and thinking for a moment we will about what we already have. Thomas was not with them. No, he didn't experience what they experienced at that time of the risen Jesus. But let's think about what Thomas did have. Because Thomas has a number of things. I think, first of all, Thomas has the testimony of nature and creation itself that he has in common with all of human beings. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Romans. He says, for what, in chapter 1, verse 19, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Whenever people look at the world around them, and today they don't even have to leave their homes, and some wonderful footage has brought the world into our homes in the form of programs like the Blue Planet and such like, and they set before us the most amazing and intricate pictures and descriptions for us to see how it all works, how amazing it is, how marvellous it is. And of course, many of the people who are presenting these programmes are thrilled by it. They're overwhelmed by it. They're moved by it. And their, their senses are moved. Their emotions are moved. Although we never hardly, if ever, hear anyone expressing, I wonder what's behind it all. But that, of course, is the the big question that sort of it's there. It's the, it's the elephant in the room, if you want to say. How has this all come about? But the Lord is declaring in Scripture on endless times that he is the creator. And here in Romans, Paul is saying to the Christians in Rome, he says, look, everyone is without excuse because the things that God has made reveal the God who made them. Of course, there are today people who refer to this as nature just. Do you ever notice? And they sort of say things like Mother Nature, sadly. But we as Christians declare it to be the work of the Lord. God's spoken word has formed at his will and out of love for his glory. Now, it is sufficient to raise questions about life, existence and origin. It may not be adequate to explain every single thing, but it does create a sense of understanding that you exist because someone has made you to exist. There is a creator behind it. So there is a testimony in creation. And then secondly, there's the testimony of others. Thomas was told by the disciples. Verse 25 says that. It says, so the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. So here's the testimony of others. These are the men that, and some woman, no doubts, that were there as well. Maybe Mary was there, one of the very first to have heard this message. And 
And, and these are the people that Thomas knew. These are the people that Thomas had lived with for the last three years. These are the people who had testified to all the other things that Jesus had done. So now their testimony about Jesus having been seen is a testimony that he hears. These are men that he could trust, surely, because he had spent the time with them. These were people who had had such a close relationship with Jesus that you couldn't say that, well, they didn't really know because it was somebody else. He would know they knew who Jesus was. And not only that, but surely there were a number of them. It wasn't just one of them. It was all of them. It says the other disciples, not just one. And so you build this picture up and you, and you begin to realise this testimony of other people, this, this overwhelming testimony, not just one, not just two, not just three, not just four, but all of them. And then, of course, we can add much more today for ourselves, for we have the added witness of Scripture which Thomas had, which although must, well, must, it, it seemed not that clear at times, because Luke 24 will help us to understand that the disciples then didn't know everything. Well, they didn't know so many key things about Jesus, because Jesus on the road to Emmaus spoke to two of those disciples going back from Jerusalem. And this is what Jesus says to them in verse 25, 6 and 7 of Luke 24. He says, O foolish and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with <clears throat> Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. So think about that. Jesus is saying that if you'd really understood what I had been trying to say, if you'd really understood what the prophets have said, what the psalmists have said, you know, what this, all of the scriptures, the historical books were pointing to, you wouldn't have been taken by surprise. And of course, not only have we the testimony of the Old Testament that Jesus refers to, we have also the testimony of the New Testament, the New Testament witnesses. The gospel records themselves, four perspectives on the life of Christ, all of the witness that flows out of that, the early church in the Acts of the Apostles, the early church pastoral letters, all of this we have to help us. You could say we have such a cloud of witnesses gathered around us. So, reading the text, we see that all the disciples had their doubts. Well, that's in Luke 24, 38, where it says, Jesus says to the disciples, all the other disciples, not Thomas with them, he says, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands. So, you know, we have to be aware that they all had their doubts. That's okay. But now that Thomas has got the witness in his heart of creation, which he knows, he believes God is there. There's no question about that. But then he now has the witness and the testimony of the others to begin to figure out the truth about Jesus having risen. And then, while not at that time, but in the process of time, he will also add to that the testimony of Scripture. I think we can understand how for them this was a very big step. I mean, I know that we're asking them to believe in something that really is very hard to believe. These are the men who have witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus. They know he's been buried in the tomb. This is something that is entirely unique because on those other occasions when they witnessed people being raised from the dead, it was Jesus who raised them from the dead. But now if the Jesus who raised them from the dead is dead, how can he be raised? Well, of course, we know that, we know that that is not the story. We know that God raised him from the dead. But a little clue might be in the word here why this doesn't happen for Thomas. He says here, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails. The word unless is not in the original text, as I said, but it is inferred there. Surely it's really something going on in his heart. He says, I'm just not going to believe unless, unless this happens. You know, he has reasons to believe. They may not seem strong enough, perhaps, to someone listening, but they, they could well be the footholds that help get him off the ground and start him on the journey upwards. Because Jesus said earlier, 
when he was speaking in John, he said, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Jesus said, I'm not asking for blind faith. You have reasons to believe. There is a new song you can sing. It's maybe not a, a loud song or maybe not a long song, but even though you've got the first few words of the song of faith, you use them as a foothold to get you a little bit higher. And we'll think a little bit more of this tomorrow. The Lord bless you and guide you today as you continue to grow in your faith.